Hey everybody, it's time for the return of Lollapalooza. That's right, there's so much to say about the Lalo storyline in the season five finale that I decided to give Lalo a breakdown of his very own once again. Strap in for Lollapalooza part two here on Basement Breakdown. Let's do it. All right, the season five finale, something unforgivable. Before I get to Lalo, let's appreciate this setup scene. It's the first shot after the title sequence uh, in the season finale, and it's this tracking shot that follows Gus along the length of the burned out Los Pollos Hermanos building that he and Nacho torched in uh, JMM. Snaking along the top of the frame is this word, caution, caution, caution. You can practically hear the words being said as the camera tracks, al tracks along the fence. Gus is often the model of caution. In a different context, you could read this as a label, speaking to Gus's state of mind. I don't think that's what it's doing here. In this context, I see it more as a warning from a Greek chorus who Gus cannot hear, because he's not cautious here. He's so totally fueled by revenge. The image that speaks to his state of mind is not the caution tape, but the burned out Los Pollos Hermanos logos that are everywhere, the wreckage. They embody the carnage for which Gus wants revenge. In particular, he's driven by grief for his fallen partner, Max, the other hermano in Los Pollos Hermanos, somebody with which Gus shared at least a brotherly love. I think it's safe to assume that they were actual lovers as well. Max was gunned down by Hector Salamanca on Don Eladio's pool patio, an image that has been evoked more than once this season, most prominently with the dedicado a Max fountain, in the episode of the same name. I discussed that at some length in my episode breakdown. Uh, one image I haven't covered yet, in JMM when Gus is preparing the chicken fryer bomb that he's going to unleash on his own restaurant, we see the pool of oil with the max indicator at the top. Just another tiny reminder of Gus's motivations. This need for revenge has built up as Gus has suffered the setbacks and indignities of war with Lalo Salamanca. So Mike's appeal on Nacho's behalf has no chance once Gus calculates that Nacho's presence in Lalo's compound increases the chances of success in this assassination attempt, right? Mike is still trying to map some faint moral code onto the game, this game of the criminal world that he talks about, but Gus is playing only for vengeance. Gus's lack of caution means that he's not thinking about how Nacho could actually become a threat to him. And in that, he has something in common with Lalo Salamanca. There's Lalo. Everybody's happy to see him. He's the life of the party. The trouble with Lalo is one minute you're everything to him, and then the next you're nothing. As the aptly named Zero can tell you, Zero, right? This little reunion seems to be at a height of warmth as Lalo teases his crew. They're supposed to be guarding this place, but uh, I just keep them around because they're so pretty, right? <laughs> then, before the smile has even left Lalo's face, he's chewing out Ciro. We see how quickly Lalo's beloved friends and family can become disposable. And indeed, in his final moments, Ciro is basically a sack of meat absorbing bullets for Lalo. The moment with Ciro and the luggage in the car and him chewing him out, it doesn't mean that much to Nacho. He already knows how mercurial Lalo can be, and in fact, we already know that too. The scene happens here in this place to establish that there is no safe inner sanctum with Lalo. And to drive that point home, there's this little flourish of Better Call Saul dark comedy that ends the scene. Welcome, smile, you're in my house, man. Come on, come in. Oye, la agüita de Jamaica, no? Lalo's reality, you're in my house, man. Nacho's reality, slam. And that slam sets up the climax of Nacho's story when he manages to breach that wall against all odds. In the meantime, we're subjected to this slow build of tension, tension that is stoked with lines like, Hey, don't think I don't see you, eh? I see you. I do. Lalo says that in genuine appreciation, but Nacho and we can't help thinking about the threat that lies therein, right? Of what would happen if Lalo really could see Nacho. 
I'll also note that I See You is another example of a motif throughout this season uh, that has taken place of Lalo's gaze being a point of emphasis, right? And an effect along the same lines is achieved by these shots, these classic Breaking Bad style shots that make us feel the the glare of Lalo's gaze on us, as Nacho does. Because in this shot, we are the obscured subject of his gaze. We feel like we're hidden barely, barely obscured as he's peering around in there, we could be discovered at any moment, right? And that's how Nacho's situation feels. That energy is even heightened when Lalo asks Nacho for a flashlight and shines it in her face, and now we literally feel the glare in this close-up angle and this claustrophobic framing. I just want to call out some grace in cinematography and editing here because the very next shot uses natural light to sustain that glare, such that even as the dramatic space opens up necessarily beyond the engine compartment, that glare is maintained using the sun. That sensation of Lalo's light coming at us is extended. These thoughtful elements of the composition work to accentuate the underlying tension. The shop lights in the garage scene from the guy for this earlier this season worked in a similar way to play up Jimmy's feeling that he was caught in Lalo's spotlight. Another parallel in that scene, it began with Lalo working on his car with the car acting as an avatar for Lalo's drug operation. When Lalo first considers Saul, we see him tinkering with the car, and later when Saul delivers on his mission, we see Lalo tooling around the track, hot rodding, enjoying his souped up car. A thrill that parallels his excitement over the upgrade that Saul has provided to the Salamanca operation. That's the Cliff's Note version of the full breakdown. There's a link in the description if you want more. In the season finale, we see Lalo bent over an engine again because his attention has returned to the Salamanca operation. This time, Nacho is the upgrade, but the energy here is different. It's not so much Lalo supercharging the engine so much as it's a tune-up. It's routine maintenance. And Lalo is turning his attention to routine maintenance because Kim gave him such an effective dressing down at the end of the last episode. What did she tell him? Jesus, get your shit together! Lalo didn't just withdraw. He took her words to heart. He immediately changed course to do just what Kim told him to do. Get his shit together. Remember, Lalo wasn't planning to bring Nacho with him to Mexico until after Kim talked some sense into him. When he seeks stability, Lalo's move is to install a number two. This is one of the elemental character through lines that weave throughout Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. It's one of the basic engines of plot and character development. Characters gravitate to pairs. A big part of this dynamic is that pairs hold the promise of stability, often an illusory promise, but it's what they're seeking nonetheless. Destabilized characters will seek out a pair. A stable foundation, for instance, is what Gus sees in Mike this season and vice versa, and this is the echo of that for Lalo. He says to Nacho, Right now, steady is what we need. Nacho is there because with Nacho's promotion, Lalo was trying to put the Salamanca machine back in order, giving it that much-needed tune-up to address the weakness that Kim saw through. He has nobody to trust. He has no number two. The Salamanca operation is in shambles. Of course, Kim was perfectly equipped to see through Lalo. She spent years with Jimmy. And just like Jimmy, Lalo conceals his weakness with swagger and showmanship. Kim sees right through that. She's immune to that trick. Lalo's tactics work a little better at Don Eladio's compound because you know who responds well to swagger and showmanship? Vain men like Don Eladio here. Before Lalo's big show comes the opening act. We've got these three cubes of money on the table. Juan Bolsa is presenting Don Eladio with these three giant bricks of cash. It's a lot of money made to appear as boring as possible. They're colorless. The framing is very pat, very static. Don Eladio is unimpressed. Juan Bolsa's physicality is tight. It's defensive. Couldn't be a more boring way to present millions and millions of dollars. And now, in contrast, comes the main event. Lalo enters center stage. I love the wardrobe here. It's perfect. Lalo's shirt matches the flowers, right? He's loud and he blends in at the same time. 
It's appropriate because what he's doing here is camouflaging himself in the bubbly energy of the party so Don Eladio can't see him clearly. Because remember, Lalo's coming into this episode from a very weak position, as we've discussed. Lalo's entrance is shot with a steady cam that allows us to feel the swirl of excitement and motion that he creates as he wheezes through the party. He lights up every corner of the festivities here. It's a full-on charm offensive. Watch as Tony Dalton transforms his performance second to second, moment to moment, as he growls in familiarity at the men and coos at the women. And finally, seducing the only member of the crowd who matters, the Don himself. As Lalo prepares to dazzle the Don with a new car, the camera shoots from basically underneath Lalo. It's another creative use of natural light because by putting the fob in line with the sun here and putting our perspective down here, it makes the dazzlement literal, right? Lalo is going to dazzle the Don with this car and we are being dazzled in this shot. He's going to divert the Don's attention from Lalo's weaknesses. To Juan Bolsa's chagrin, the dog and pony show worked to perfection. It has its intended effect. Moments earlier, we saw Don Eladio accept three bricks of cash as if Gus Fring had just taken a poop on his patio, right? Now he gets one brick of cash, but because it comes wrapped in a vintage Ferrari, he's thrilled. And the funniest thing is, Don Eladio comes right out and names the game. Si, Bolsa, esto es showmanship. And the show must go on now. Having worked his audience of one into a froth, Lalo hands the microphone over to Mr. Entertainment himself, Nacho Varga. Wow, Don, if you thought money and sports cars were fun, wait till you get some glum introspection from Nacho. Mwah! It's gonna be a blast. The episode proceeds straight into the Don's conversation with Nacho because the juxtaposition of Lalo's noise and Nacho's statuesque intensity as portrayed by Michael Mando creates this contrast that makes us appreciate both characters more and it brings out the complementarity of the Nacho Lalo pair, not just for us, but also for Don Eladio, right? Aesthetically, I'll note that the photography of Nacho as the episode proceeds is more and more about heat. And there's really nothing esoteric about this. It's classic coding. The script is written for us to feel the heat on Nacho escalating over the course of the episode. So of course the image is built in the same way. Just feel the environment of this wide shot, a mix of colors, this pale blue sky. It feels like an oasis. Same deal with the single of Don Eladio, right? The shade of the tree, the blue sky, it makes it feel calm, like you're on vacation. Is Nacho in the same place? No. As Don Eladio pushes back at him and questions his plan to maybe wage war on biker gangs, Nacho is in a crucible, right? So the image looks like that. The sky is blown out. The tree line is frayed. It glows orange, almost as like it's on fire. I even see like embers flickering across the pattern of Nacho's shirt. Fire and heat. When Don Eladio pours a new drink for Nacho, signaling his approval, we cut to this verdant shot and we feel the heat come off. Nacho talks his way through this meet and greet with the Don by sharing his plan to exploit various factions among biker gangs. Esas bandas están divididas. Las enfrentamos uno contra otro. Is he really thinking about the bikers or is Nacho's tale of a drug enterprise crippled by factionalism inspired by his uniquely deep view of the Fring Salamanca conflict? Maybe he's talking about the bikers. Maybe he's talking about something closer, the, closer to home. I think that Nacho the prophet here has more to say than Don Eladio necessarily hears. In any case, Nacho does maintain his cool in the heat. So after he describes his patient under the radar strategy, Don Eladio declares him a businessman. Remember, Nacho is Lalo's guy. So Don Eladio is naturally going to make some assumptions about his temperament. Assumptions that might even be deepened when Lalo says that Nacho is Tuco's friend, right? And how does the Don react? Like, you must be nuts. That line, you're a businessman, is the signal that Nacho has defied those assumptions. He's not another hothead showman. He works quietly and deliberately. And Don Eladio appreciates that complimentary en energy that he brings to Lalo's operation. I think his opinion of Nacho is raised, but also his opinion of Lalo is, is raised because Lalo's not just seeking someone else like him. They're a matched pair. By the time 3 a.m. rolls around, we understand better than ever what a good pair Nacho and Lalo could be. 
This thread of character development is important because it's the story that Lalo sees. He's completed the pair. He has his number two. He's the picture of contentment as he tells Nacho to retrieve two, two glasses. glasses. In a shot that makes him look like the devil incarnate, by the way. Lalo sees two. Nacho sees three. He knows what happens at 3 a.m. He knows about the unseen third party at the compound that night. This is a suspenseful scene, and the performers draw that out, but there's still an undercurrent of playful wit in the script, because all Nacho wants is to make Lalo look away, avert his gaze for a minute. And what does Lalo talk about the whole time? Oh, I never have to sleep. Ho-hum, maybe I'll never close my eyes again. Having built the suspense up so high, the writers are basically toying with us now, but it's just totally in keeping with the character. The intensity of Lalo's gaze has been built up in so many scenes throughout the season that averting it now does feel like an impossible task. Nacho does pull it off, of course, and I'll highlight the pivotal moment in the action sequence that ensues when Lalo's descending into this uh, trick bathtub here, this bathtub escape tunnel. Just before he pulls it closed, he stops and listens. And what does he hear? He hears that he's losing. He hears that he might be the only one left there. And he leaves it open. That decision that we see changes the complexion of everything that follows. If he just closes the tub, it's an escape. It's premeditated. He's fleeing. He's playing defense. When he leaves the tub open, we see him make the decision so we know it's improvised. We're in the moment. He's playing offense. That's the inflection point of the scene, this bathtub moment. When Lalo rises like Lazarus from the ground and he astonishingly starts walking back to the compound, it dawns on us that even though he looks hobbled and alone, Lalo holds the advantage now. The swell of the music and a dramatic expansion of the visual space accomplished by a camera move and a focus shift help convey this shift in fortunes, such that as soon as we cut to this shot of the assassins looking in the tunnel, we already know how their story will end. From the bathtub onward, this scene is designed purely to let us savor Lalo the badass, and why the hell not? It sure is fun. Later, Lalo looks at the table where he and Nacho were sitting before, and he sees in a new light the story of two that he was telling himself earlier. He sees the two glasses, but there's three figures on the table here the two glasses and the bottle of Louis XIII cognac. Louis XIII, who ascended to the throne after his father, Henry IV, was assassinated. If only Lalo had caught the foreshadowing. Oh well. We conclude on a great note of pulpy melodrama. This whole chaos, this mayhem at the Salamanca compound began with the death of Ciro. Just like I said, being held up like a bag of meat. A death that meant nothing to Lalo. It concludes with Lalo discovering the death of somebody he really did care for. Yolanda, this person Lalo wrapped his arms around as soon as he arrived home. We barely know Yolanda. She only appears in this episode, Something Unforgivable, so that she can be the something unforgivable for Lalo. She's the betrayal that ignites a deeper fury in Lalo. This full head of rage that we can tell is propelling him into the next chapter of his story. It's no longer a game for him. Now Lalo has, akin to Gus, his own thirst for revenge. And we experience it in the thundering distortion of the soundtrack as Lalo's footsteps are transformed into what sounds like crackling explosions of ordnance blowing up on a battlefield. Speaking of foreshadowing. That wraps up season five, and I know what you're saying. Is that all? Well, no. In fact, there's a whole other breakdown dedicated to the Kim Jimmy storyline. Link is in the description. And there are more videos on the way. Thank you for watching. As always, this is my take. Share your perspective. Add to it in the comments. I'd love to see what you thought. Uh, shout out to intrepid editor Brendan. That's all for now. See you soon.